Hey folks, here is the lecture on the Great Depression and New Deal. This is going to be the first part. I imagine it'll be broken up into two or three parts, um, not including the Herbert Hoover installment that I asked you to watch prior to this. Now, hopefully you realize by now that uh, the Great Depression was not caused, in fact, cause and effect by what happened in October of 1929. So the stock market crash was a great contributing factor amongst a number of factors. Now, interestingly, if you look here at Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929, actually the market had a worse day today, the 16th of March, 2020, than that day. Now, of course, this was the culmination of many factors from the 1920s uh, that we talked about in the Hoover lecture. Um, what's happening right now is, is truly just, you know, uh, um, a confluence of a number of events all related to COVID-19. So same impact, but certainly different factors. Now, when we look at 1929, again, the depression doesn't really fully get going for another two, two and a half years, but certainly it represented financial travesty and tragedy and tumult that Hoover was going to need to deal with. So of course we bring in Herbert Hoover, who by all accounts, if you just looked at him on paper, would be perhaps the greatest person, like the archetype of the person you would want dealing with financial calamity. He had been a self-made engineering millionaire. He had been incredibly instrumental in, of course, saving Belgium uh, in terms of food relief. He had been the head of the Food Administration during World War I, asking people to go, you know, wheatless and porkless. And really, his experience during World War I taught him that people, if asked, would come together in a voluntary spirit without the government necessarily mandating them to do that. Now, he parlayed that initial Food Administration work into being the Commerce Secretary, so a man who really, you know, was involved in business. And then the only man to ever go from Commerce secre Secretary to the presidency. So if there was anybody that could have sort of worked their way out of this, you would have thought it was Herbert Hoover. Now, when you think about it, you know, what did he do? Well, generally speaking, he was one of those people that believed in this sort of laissez-faire orthodoxy that we'd seen for so long in 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1893. The government had done nothing. It was hands off. Now, in this particular case, Hoover actually did sign the Smoot-Hawley or Hawley-Smoot tariff, which was originally designed to be helping farmers and ended up being anything but and only caused uh, other countries to raise their tariff walls and really helped contribute along with that stock market crash to the Great Depression. But that was that was actually hands on. He was trying to do something. And then he will do what's called the RFC or the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which is designed to basically give money to sort of financial institutions like banking and insurance companies. And they would sort of, you know, trickle that money down to the common man. And then you had the Agricultural Marketing Act, which was supposed to give money to what they called farm boards, who would find ways to help farmers, neither of which were sort of direct relief for quote unquote, the common man. And in both cases, they really failed. Um, so yes, Herbert Hoover did more than any president at any time in any financial crisis, yet it wasn't enough. And in doing so, people really saw Hoover as disconnected from the common man. Either he was patently unable or totally unwilling to sort of admit what was going on. And as a result, couldn't instill the confidence in the people. He kept saying the prosperity is right around the corner. People were like, are you looking at what you're seeing, uh, what we're seeing? You, you are ridiculous. And of, and of course, we see that uh, little orphan Annie singing about, we'd like to thank you, Herbert Hoover. So in the end, what we're going to see is that FDR gets elected. I'll talk about that in a second. But even when FDR gets elected, the unemployment rate is about 25% and it is not going to immediately go down. So despite the fact that people saw FDR as this savior, he does not come in immediately and have you know, the greatest impact. So in the election of 1932, both sides claimed we're the best ones to solve this. The Democrats, who had not been in office since Wilson, so they had Harding and then Harding dies and you have Coolidge and then Coolidge goes into Hoover. They said, you know, let's kick out the Republicans and the Depression with, you know, again, a good elephant Democrat. Now, on the flip side, you had Hoover and the Republicans saying, bring back the prosperity of the 1920s with us. And many people said, well, you, you had your chance and Republicans didn't seem to do it from you know, 1929 when Hoover came into the election of 1932. So 
when FDR was trolling Hoover, he's basically saying, return the government to the people. What they're really saying is the common man or what FDR called the forgotten man. And you'll see it very boldly right across, like we need action. It was absolutely a key idea of FDR's campaign. So if you look at this, what he says is he's calling out Hoover. We've had four years of false prophecies, broken promises, blundering statesmanship. And then he goes through all of the, the, the data, 11 million idle laborers, 30 million American people living on charity, 12,000 bank failures, 600,000 homes and farm foreclosures. And then it says farming is in a terrible place. Food is piling up. Well, millions are suffering. So he says the battle hasn't been won. Again, saying you had your chance, Hoover. The fundamental cause of our distress has not been remedied. We are still suffering. And every day we wait just makes it worse. And so it's interesting that FDR ran on a campaign of happy days are here again. And if you look right at that banner, you see a big frothing mug of beer. And of course, Remember, during the 1920s, prohibition. So beer wasn't legal. And in fact, one of the first things that FDR is going to do is he's actually going to legalize beer and then to try to, again, get revenue from that. And then ultimately, we're going to see the 21st Amendment. But let me play a little bit of that. Happy days are here again. This was the theme. Again, this sort of ebullient, joyous, we can, in fact, change these gloomy days. Here we go. <laughs> So contrast that to, we'd like to thank you, Herbert Hoover, for, uh, again, you know, showing us the way of despair and Hoovervilles and all of that misery. We're going to hope that happy days are here again. And in fact, the election, is, it's not like Eisenhower against Adlai Stevenson in 52 and 56 or like Monroe winning in the era of good feeling or Washington winning his first election, but it's pretty darn close to unanimous. The country is there for FDR. And now, when we think back about FDR, it's interesting because FDR is number one on the list that's in the room that hopefully we'll get to return to at some point. But FDR is number one because he basically fought two wars. One was this going to be, you know, this warlike action against poverty and unemployment. And of course, World War II. And so people loved FDR. And FDR said of, him, of himself, in the years to come, that word president will be a word to cheer the hearts of common men and women everywhere. As in, the president is here to help you. The president is not your adversary. The president is not there to thwart you. The president is there to help. Now, there are many people who think that FDR is the worst president of all time. And again, many of these are true hands-off the economy conservatives who will say, if you love big government, war, socialism, and bailouts, FDI is your guy. But if you believe in economic freedom and personal liberty, then FDR was a horrible president. There is no doubt that FDR created a giant government that was only built on later by people like LBJ. So FDR plus LBJ really is going to equal Ronald Reagan. And then Reagan's going to come in what's known as you know, the Republican Revolution or the neoconservative movement in 1980 and basically say, you know, all that was really problematic. We need a small government returning it to the people, which is interesting because in both cases, the argument was returning it to the people. In one sense, it was FDR said, we need a big government to help the people. And Reagan would say, we don't need a big central government. We need state governments to help the people. So it's really important that we look at themes in this first inaugural address that FDR gives. Importantly, it's the last inaugural address that's given in March because you're going to have the 20th Amendment that actually moves it up after that. After people were just like, wait a second, we have to wait and wait and wait and wait for Hoover to still be in here. Can't we get a president in here already? So by his fourth term, sorry, four years later in FDR's second term, you're going to see the inauguration moved up. So We've looked at a number of inaugural addresses. We've we've paid attention to what Washington talked about with unity. He also said that in his farewell address. We looked at Jefferson, who was also talking about unity. We've looked at Lincoln's first and second inaugural address. But when we look at FDR, it's really important to understand that we're looking at some key themes, like decisive action, honesty, 
confidence, which I think goes with honesty and decisive action. And then a leader, him, and a government who cares about the people and should be trusted. So he talks about having a candor, again, an honesty, and a decision. Again, this is all very counter to the criticisms that really went after Hoover, is that Hoover wasn't honest. Either he couldn't be or he wasn't. He wasn't decisive. Yes, he did do the RFC and he did do the AMA, but neither one really worked out. He said, we it's time to speak the truth. We can't shrink from honestly facing conditions. We have to tell it like it is. And of course, the most famous words of the inaugural address and some of the most famous words in American history, that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself which is too bad because you guys know that I hate the word thing. So if I was actually grading this, I would crater out thing there, but we'll leave it in there because it's FDR. And what he's saying is we can do this. If you just stop being paralyzed by fear and you realize what is possible, this can be done. And he said, I'm going to give this to you with frankness, honesty, and vigor, action. And I'm convinced that you will again give that support to leadership. So I need you to support us. I know you didn't support Hoover because you didn't feel supported by Hoover but you gotta support my administration. And then with his honesty, he says, yeah, there are a ton of unemployed people. And I'd be a fool if I didn't say that this is what was going on, okay? So again, he's talking about happy days coming, but he says these dark days will be worth it if they teach us that we are not in fact to basically receive government's help, but actually to sort of, help ourselves. Now, that's a really interesting statement because he's talking about community and coming together. Interestingly, Hoover was somebody who felt like the people shouldn't be ministered to, they should help themselves. But that in fact didn't work. That was his whole sort of idea of this, you know, associative state and this voluntary action that didn't necessarily work. So again, people were not confident in the government and FDR says, you know, small wonder that confidence languishes. Like, again, it will only work if it's honest. I failed to mark that word honesty right there in the second paragraph. He said, this nation asks for action and action now. So we're going to put people to work, okay? We're going to use the government to get people working. We're going to treat this like a war. Again, as you prepare for a war, you need decisive action. And we're going to help people, okay, um, create really sort of large scale projects, not entirely sure why that's a that different color blue there. And we're gonna reorganize the use of natural resources. Believe it or not, when we talked about Teddy, we certainly talked about that, you know, conflict between conservation, uh, you know, Teddy and his boy Gifford Pinchot versus John Muir and preservation. But we're gonna see that FDR does a ton for natural resources as well. And he's gonna do that by sort of acting and acting quickly. And one of the you know big organizations he's involved with is something called the Triple C, as well as the Tennessee Valley Authority. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But he says, really, we can't go back to the old way. We have to keep an eye on the financial institutions and we have to make sure that there is not over speculation. He's talking about that again, 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1893, they're all over speculation. We saw that speculation, particularly in the stock market in the 1920s. He's saying it's got to stop. We have to be able to create some protection from that. But then he says, you guys can't feel like you failed. You didn't fail. But what you did do is you did elect me. You registered a mandate that you want direct, vigorous action. That's a success, he's saying. And we're going to be successful in making this all work together. Now, again, this is this top part is sort of a, a reiteration of what the themes were. We only have to fear fear itself. We're going to have drastic, even more like action, optimism and confidence. But it's really important that you understand that FDR used the radio. Now, others had used the radio. The radio was not brand new, but no one had used it in the way that FDR was going to. And then these fireside chats, he attempted to talk directly to the American people. Again, the people that felt they never got the straight story from Herbert Hoover. And in doing so, he was building confidence in his leadership and what his administration was doing. It's also interesting that he was really, really good to the media and he won a bunch of support from the media. And so they wrote much more sort of complimentary and laudatory stories. They also never mentioned the fact that again, he was in a wheelchair from polio. And so even when he was inaugurated, he actually stood there and gave this famous inaugural address. He had worked for months on how to basically use his son as a crutch 
to walk up there. So again, in DC, people saw him walking. So no one had any real reason to believe that he wasn't strong. And again, if the president was seen as being in a wheelchair, perhaps that would have undermined that whole idea of vigor and activeness that he was trying to portray. And most Americans, again, didn't have TV uh, at the time or early images, but we were certainly not prevalent. Um, no one knew that he was paralyzed and in a wheelchair. Now, we're going to talk about the people that helped him on his way. And he, in fact, really took an interesting strategy. He really recruited out of the Ivy League. Again, not surprising. Most of our presidents uh, were Ivy League, and, and many of them had staff that were Ivy League. But he wanted these sort of young liberal professors who were known originally as the Brains Trust, which just sounds weird, and then later the Brain Trust. And you can see this picture on Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair still a very popular magazine. And you can see this sort of egghead, weird, almost alien looking academic who is a tattoo artist. And it's fascinating. We're going to see Uncle Sam in so many different guises throughout these uh, cartoons. But here it is, a tattooed, very skinny um, Uncle Sam who's getting inked up with all sorts of different uh, what we call alphabet soup agencies or New Deal agencies. You'll notice the sign says, you know, one dollar for a tattoo, but for an eagle right there in the middle, which is the NRA, uh, which we'll certainly talk about, which was a really a significant program. And in fact, the reason why the Philadelphia Eagles are called the Philadelphia Eagles. OK, so then we have to think about this. And I don't know if any of you are cooking today um, or have ever cooked um, or love to cook. Don't know. I know that certainly the chef, Big Figa and the Big Ziti, uh, he is a chef. But um, something that you do when you're trying to figure out if spaghetti is ready is you throw it at the wall. And so there's become this sort of idiom that says, oh, they're just throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what sticks. Now, in some ways, that's exactly what the New Deal was. And in fact, FDR never articulated what he was going to give to America. He just said a New Deal for the American people. And so that New Deal, which you, of course, can't see because it's behind my spaghetti, darn it, is um, FDR giving to Uncle Sam a whole host of sort of different bottles and elixirs and medicine to try out and just sort of hoping that, you know, you can see the caption. Of course, we may have to change some remedies if we don't get results. He never said this is going to be the definitive answer. He said, we're going to try stuff. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, we're going to try something else. And so that's very much the idea of this confidence. So here you have Uncle Sam now um, prostrate in bed. He's got a cast that says banking. He's got budget problems. I can't see what it says on his face. Maybe taxes. And he's got his arm depression. And it says confidence in your doctor is half the battle. So at the end of the day, yeah, you just needed to believe that it was going to work as opposed to living in this truly like glass is half empty world that the Americans lived in under Hoover, despite the fact that Hoover was saying it was actually half full. Now, it's interesting, of course, that with the inaccuracy in this illustration is that FDR, you know, couldn't walk. And so, again, we, we have to just think about what was being projected in terms of that vigor and activeness when, in fact, yes, he was all those things, but, but he couldn't walk. Now, it's important to realize that as soon as he takes office, he is going to get stuff done. And he has a Democratic Congress that is going to sign off on everything. They basically say, yeah, we're with you. Go do it. So just two days after he's taken office in March of 1933, he issues a proclamation that says all American banks are closed for four days until Congress can check them out. You know, interestingly, I don't want to make it a total parallel, but we're certainly seeing governors, not necessarily the president, closing uh, institutions throughout the states. Those are more, again, for public health. Uh, this was, again, to try to figure out the financial health of the banks. And again, the reason they were doing that it was is that people were not putting their money in banks. They were literally keeping it under their mattress at home because if they thought that if they put it in banks, they could never really get it out. So after everything has been sort of checked out. There's the Emergency Banking Act, where there's going to be this major inspection that goes on. You can't reopen until the Treasury Department has come in and made sure you're, you're doing okay. Um, if you're not doing okay, we're going to try to help you out. Again, the whole idea was to inspire financial confidence so people would put their money into the bank. Because if people put their money into the bank, that money can then be circulated. 
And again, hopefully we understand, we talked about it before, that when you put your money in the bank, it's actually out there for loans, helping the economy go. So it's really, really important to realize that once FDR had closed all the banks, they'd investigated the banks, they'd open up the ones that were working, you're going to see about a billion dollars in hoarded currency all of a sudden flow back into the bank. So now the lifeblood of the economy can get going. Now, I want to play FDR's first fireside chat just a bit. This is might seem elementary to you uh, in terms of what he's explaining, but this is really the first time that he connects with the American people as a president. He's going to do it many more times throughout his three plus terms. My friend, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit, in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. A comparatively small part of the money that you put into the bank is kept in currency an amount which in normal times is fully sufficient to cover the cash needs of the average citizen. So it's really important to recognize that he, again, he's thanking people. He's telling them exactly what he's going to do. He wants them to feel that it's transparent. That there's being very sort of clear action. Then he explains, he says, God, we need your money. We need your money because that actually makes the wheels of the economy turn. Okay. So I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to pick up uh, really the alphabet soup uh, in another lecture. But again, if it's a throwdown topic, namely the AAA or NERA, which created um, the NRA or the C or the Tennessee Valley or Social Security, I won't cover them in great detail because I know that you're actually researching them for your throwdown. So they're incredibly important and they're a bit confusing because they seem similar. Um, but again, uh, I'm going to do that in my next lecture.